next talk is called Uncover, Understand, and Own, uh, Regaining Control Over Your AMB, AMD CPU. And I must say, it's, it's the days where a, your homebrew PC would have been like one CPU plus a lot of discrete logic, those days are long, long gone. And now every single device, probably even this microphone, is full of microprocessors. It's pretty crazy. Um, Robert, Alexander, and Christian discovered that the ARM, sorry, that discovered an actual ARM processor on an AMD CPU, which I find quite mind-boggling. And, um, and it actually includes its own firmware. And to talk about that, I'd like to welcome them onto the stage. And, uh, and uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing all about this discovery and what it has for consequences for us. So thank you very much. Give them a hand. All right, thanks. So before we dive into the topic, a quick introduction. So this is Christian, and this is Alex, and I'm Robert. And the reason why there is three of us today is um, I'm a PhD student at the Technische Universität in Berlin. And at the beginning of 2018, I was looking into the secure encrypted virtualization technology from AMD. And this technology requires a firmware running on the secure processor of AMD. And that's where Christian came into play, because he was looking for a master thesis. Now, Christian is done with his thesis, and Alex here kind of took over his work. But today, we're going to explain to you what the AMD Secure Process is doing and what we have uncovered. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Christian. Thank you. So let's dive right into our first part of the presentation, which is about reverse engineering a completely unknown subsystem. And when we started our research, we had to find out what the AMD Secure Processor, formerly called Platform Security Processor, in this talk, PSP, actually is. And it's a dedicated security subsystem that is integrated into your AMD CPU, both on um, server and desktop CPUs. It's an ARM Cortex-A5 um, inside your x86 CPU, and it's there since uh, around 2013. It runs a so-called secure OS and a kernel, um, and it's actually undocumented and proprietary. It has access to some secure off-chip um, storage uh, for the firmware and some, some data, and it mainly provides crypto functionality to the main CPU, as well as um, yeah, key generation and key management functionality. It's required for um, the early boot. Um, in fact, it's required for secure boot, and it's, it acts as a trust anchor in, um, in your system. So the PSP is a security subsystem, so it adds security to our system, and that's, that's good, right? You might notice that this has some similarities with uh, the Intel management engine, which on this very stage we heard a lot about three hours ago. Um, so let's look into the applications of this, um, yeah, on, of this piece of hardware. Um, for that, we need to talk about trust. The one form of trust um, AMD uh, tackles in what they call secure encrypted virtualization. So you, as a cloud customer, can be sure that your virtual machine can even run in an untrusted physical location, for example, in a data center. The PSP that is running inside that server CPU acts as a remote trusted entity for you as a customer, and it promises you to protect your uh, memory, so your data, from the hypervisor and even from physical access, for example, through an, a data center uh, administrator. The other form of trust that the PSP tries to, to establish um, is now um, arriving in the Linux kernel, um, and that's an API to a trusted execution environment. What that actually is, is that the PSP acts as a black box inside your system that is trusted by an external entity, for example, a content provider like Netflix. This would enable 
um, for example, digital right management um, on an untrusted system, that is your system, uh, like Linux. So to sum this all up, the PSP runs code that you don't know and that you don't control. And first of all, let's talk about the knowing. What you see here is a super micro uh, motherboard, a server motherboard, uh, from the top. And I highlighted three components here, which are required um, or essential for, for boot up, of course. That is the CPU, the, um, the disk, and um, a so-called SPI flash. The SPI flash is a simple storage that is available during early boot. So if you look at the boot procedure in a simplified manner, then the CPU will first load the BIOS from this SPI flash. And only at a later stage of booting, when the necessary drivers are at hand, it will be able to access the hard disk to um, load the operating system. Now, as we saw from, from AMD's marketing slides, um, there's, there's the PSP now. And the PSP is actually part of the CPU. It even boots before the CPU boots and will, um, only after successful initialization of the system, release the x86 CPU. So the PSP firmware is loaded, loaded first. And after that, um, the boot is, is proceeding as we know it with the BIOS and the operating system. So where is this PSP firmware coming from? Well, the BIOS is stored on the just, uh, just mentioned SPI flash memory. And it contains all the data and code that is used, of course, uh, during, during boot up. And it is arranged according to the UEFI image specification. So it's a standardized format. That's, that's good. So maybe we should have a look into a supermicro uh, UEFI update. Um, you see a screenshot from the open source tool UEFI tool, which is able to um, parse the UEFI image specification. Um, you see information, for example, like the full size. This is um, 16 megabytes. That's the traditional. That's the size of a traditional SPI flash. And you see several um, volumes um, which contain BIOS code and data. What you can also spot are two so-called paddings, non-empty paddings. And these are paddings because, or these are called padding by the tool because they are not part of the UEFI standard. And we're not able to pass them with the standardized um, information available. So let's use another tool. Um, probably many of you know Binwalk, um, a command line tool for extracting um, firmware from, from images and for forensics in general. And let's look at the um, machine instructions we can find in that UEFI update for the Super Micro board. So the second block you see are Intel x86 instructions. This is what we expect, right? It's, it's a BIOS update for an x86 CPU. So that's, that's, that's not surprising. What is more surprising um, is, um, are the ARM instructions. So we might be very close to um, the PSP firmware. And what we found out um, by staring at uh, bytes in a hex editor a lot is um, what we call the firmware file system of the platform security processor. And the central data structure in it um, is the directory. A directory is, um, starts with a, a magic string, in this case, $PSP. And um, it will have a checksum. It will have a number of elements that it will list and a field we don't know. And then with each line in the screenshot, you will have um, an entry in this uh, directory. And um, each entry has a type and a size and an address where it is located inside that UEFI image. So the last entry of um, this directory is a special entry. It points to a secondary directory, or that's how we call it. It's a continuation of this directory. Um, and um, each entry points to something like a file. Um, a file definitely has a body, and it might have a header and a signature. But I'm going to go into detail um, about this in just a second. <laughs> 
So now we just need a reliable entry point to pass this whole firmware file system, and this is the firmware entry table. The firmware entry table begins with a specific byte sequence, that's how you can find it, and um, it lists pointers to firmware blobs, uh, such as those directories inside the UEFI image. Earlier versions of the firmware entry table are documented in source code of the Coreboot project, an open source BIOS implementation, and that was very helpful in the beginning of our research. So, to make use of all that knowledge and all that staring at bytes here, we developed PSP tool, a command line utility that is able to parse um, any, um, uh, any AMD firmware from UEFI updates, such as the Supermicro update. And in the output, you will see um, something like a directory header here. You will find entries like something called PSP firmware bootloader. You will f see that it has a version, and PSP tool will even try to find out whether it's compressed, signed, will try to verify the signature, and so on. And just um, as, a, as, a, as a recap here, you can see that the last entry of this directory actually points to another directory, which PSP tool uh, parses for you as well. So in order to enable you to look into the code that is running on your AMD CPU right now, PSP tool is available on GitHub, and uh, you can check it out today. So the PSP runs code we don't know. Well, now it's a matter of binary analysis to um, actually find out what it does. Let's talk about the control. Are we able to alter the firmware to run our own code? For that, we um, had to play around with hardware. And um, more specifically, we used an SPI programmer to um, flash any um, arbitrary UEFI image onto the SPI flash. After, for example, taking the original UEFI image and tinkering around with one byte or one bit, we would then try to boot the system, and in most case, it, cases, it just wouldn't boot. This was, um, this was insufficient because we only had binary, in, uh, binary output from these experiments. So we also used the logic analyzer that you can see on the top of this, um, of this picture. A logic analyzer is just um, um, an electronic instrument that can um, uh, capture the data that runs through the logic lines. In this case, between the SPI flash and the Supermicro um, board. So, Looking into a recording of one of our boot procedures, we would now be able to make sense um, of, these, uh, of, of, of these data. So, for example, we can see that the chipset here issues a read command that's defined by the byte 3. It would try to read the address E20000, and then the SPI flash would gladly respond with data at that location. Now, you might argue, the data is not that interesting because that's what we control. That's what we can program. That's what we can look into with PSP tool. So what we were more curious about is the order and timing of the actual accesses. And to make that a bit more uh, visual, we wrote PSP trace. So PSP trace takes such a um, SPI capture and correlates it to the output from PSP tool and we will get a um, yeah, enumeration of, of, of the specific components of the PSP during boot. And I'll get into detail about this also in just a second. PSP trace is available as part of the PSP tool um, repository. If you are more interested about our hardware, um, in our hardware setup, um, you can check out our talk from the CC camp um, earlier this year, where we actually um, had a Ryzen Pro a CPU at hand and yeah, just used the Lenovo ThinkPad. So that might be more suitable for your homework. So I want to share two more insights um, that we gained um, through our experiments in the beginning. First of all, cryptographic protections on files. Um, files are protected by a signature, and a field in the header 
um, determines the according public key that can be used to verify that signature. And, and that's what the PSP uh, does. So um, there are several keys actually inside the firmware file system. And then all these keys are signed by the AMD root public key, which does not have a trailing signature. But as we found out, it, um, after, loading f uh, after, after it is loaded from flash, it um, will be compared to a hash in read-only memory of the PSP. So we were not able to alter it like that. The second insight is how the early boot procedure of the PSP works. We have an on-chip bootloader that is burned into the chip, into the PSP. We have an off-chip bootloader that is loaded from flash. And then we have several applications that are loaded subsequently. So now let's look a bit more closely at the output of PSP trace. The first few um, read accesses are to the firmware entry table, the global data structure. Um, and then um, the, the on-chip bootloader will load the PSP directory. It will load the AMD public key and verify it, as I just told you, by comparing it to a, um, to a hash in, in read-only memory. It will load the PSP firmware bootloader. That's what we call the off-chip bootloader. And this one will be verified with the AMD public key. Then in the boot trace um, of PSP trace, we see a delay. That's uh, due to some initialization work the PSP does. And then it will load more directories and will load and verify some applications eventually. And with this um, rough overview of the boot procedure, I'm going to hand you over to Alex. OK. So now that we uncovered the basic modules of the firmware, we obviously wanted to gain deeper knowledge about what these individual modules do, how the firmware functions, how the PSP is constructed, what hardware it provides, and how we can interface it. So in order to do that, we need to do a uh, quick recap about how AMD structures its CPU itself. So what you see here is a little x86 core being able to execute two threads using simultaneous multi-threading. And AMD groups four of those cores into what they call a core complex. Uh, it contains up to four cores based on your exact model. And two of those complexes are put onto a CCD or core complex die. That is what AMD also calls a chiplet. So it's a single silicon chip on your CPU. And you have multiple of those chips on your, on your CPU. Among the two CCXs, it contains two, uh, the memory controller for the DDR4 memory, PCI Express lanes, uh, communication links for, to communicate with other CPUs in a system, and much more. So in our setup, you saw earlier already, we had the two socket system with two CPUs, and each of these CPUs had four CCDs. And now, we have just, not just one PSP in this whole system, but up to eight. So each of these CPUs, or if each of these little PSPs is actually executing code, even before the x86 cores have executed anything. So AMD calls the one on CCD0 the master PSP, and all the others are referred to as slaves. Um, the master coordinates the initial bring up of the platform, so for the whole initial initialization for the memory controllers and so on, and the slaves re respond to requests made by the master PSP. So each of these PSPs is identical in the system. Because they are 32-bit ARM cores, they have a 32-bit address space layout. The first 256K of this layout are backed by actual on-chip SRAM. Those, the first, the on-chip bootloader, will load the off-chip bootloader, so the PSP w, uh, FV bootloader, and place it into memory where it will be executed. Among the uh, actually, uh, firmware bootloader, you will also have the page tables for the MMU. Yes, the PSP also has a MMU and virtual memory enabled. And the code is separated into a supervisor or kernel mode and the user mode part. So the last page you see here is uh, the so-called boot ROM service page. It contains information about the PSP the code is currently executing on, like number of sockets in the system, the current CCD ID where it's executed. It contains... Um, some, some other things like a uh, number of sockets and so on, and it will become uh, important later on. Then, 
the off-chip bootloader will call the applications. Um, they are executed in user mode, they contain the code and data to bring up the actual system, and they also contain the stack memory. And this is done on, uh, during the initial uh, booter process by a f uh, using a fixed um, order, and later on when the host OS runs, it will be uh, the application, for example, for the SEV functionality will be loaded on demand. So the le rest of the space there we have to fill is taken up by MMIO. So this PSP has its own cryptographic code processor, which is not shared with the x86. Uh, you have the hardware re registers to access x86 memory, to access the system management network. What this is, we will come to in a bit. And much more we don't know about now, right now. So the boot process in detail. So Christian already to ha gave you a rough overview how the boot process is done. And now we will take a deeper look into this. So first, of course, you have the on-chip bootloader. It loads the off-chip bootloader from flash and executes it. The off-chip bootloader will execute and initialize the PSP to a bare minimum and then call the apps. The first one we have here, debug unlock and security gasket, we have no idea what they're actually for, but we named them after some strings we found in the binaries itself. So the big chunk you see here is the actual uh, bootstrapping phase. Uh, AMD calls it a Giza bootloader. And it's not just a single binary, but it hosts a binary which loads binaries from the flash furthermore and then executes it in a specific order. So you see here ABL2, uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 6. ABL5 is used for something like a warm resume from suspend to RAM, for example. So later on, if the SEV app is, for example, loaded, if the re uh, OS requests a specific SEV functionality and not before that. Because we have the separation between supervisor and user mode, we obviously need a way that the app can communicate with the off-chip bootloader. And that is done using the ARM instructions uh, supervisor call, or SVC. So we identified 76 Zeus calls in total. We have mostly reverse engineered 30 by now. We can access the x86 memory. We can communicate with other PSPs in the system. We can load entries from flash and so on. 28 are partly reverse engineered. These are mostly CCP operations for ARS app, uh, public key verification, AES encryption, and so on. And there are also more elaborate functions to communicate with other PSPs, which are required during the AGESA bootloader stage. And then we have 18 left, and these we don't know about yet because they are not called at all, or they have exactly one call site and are non-trivial to reverse engineer. So system management network, I already I saw on the slide already that there was access uh, SMN. If you Google for system management network or SMN, you, will don't, uh, you won't find much information about it by AMD or otherwise. The only reference you might find is uh, code in the Linux kernel to read out the thermal sensors on the CPU. So the system management network actually is a hidden control network inside your CPU. Each and every hardware block which is in there is connected to it and is used for the PSP to control and initialize the hardware blocks during the boot-up phase. So it is a dedicated address space, so the PSP can't directly access it using MMIO instructions. Um, and we have the PSP there, we have identified the memory controller, the system management unit for which there was a talk about I think two years ago on this very congress. Uh, the x86 cores are there as, uh, as well, and a lot of other things we didn't reverse engineer so far. One of the things, uh, okay, so to access the system management network, the PSP has to map a certain region of the system management network address space into its own address space, and then can access the register, write, read, and so on, and has to unmap it again. And one of the functions we identified is what we call memory protection slots. So the PSP has the possibility to uh, inf or to, to configure the memory controller to revoke access to certain regions of the uh, DDR4 memory from the x86 cores. This is done by using three registers. You have a start register with a physical start address, an end register to denote the physical end address of the region you want to protect, and a control register where we only know yet uh, so far the enable bit to flip it on or off. And what it does is if the protection is flipped on, the x86 will only read all bits that when it tries to access this particular region, and writes will have no effect to, part to this region as well. And this is, for example, used for the system management mode UEFI code, and for a certain functionality for the uh, secure encrypted virtualization feature of AMD. So, the next thing we did was running strings over all modules, obviously, and what we found there were a lot of interesting debug strings, and even a lot of format strings, and we wanted to know what the values were during the runtime. 
So when we disassembled the firmware and analyzed it, we saw that most of these strings were referenced right before a special call called SVC6, so this must be some sort of debug, uh, debug print for the PSP. The problem is SVC6 is not implemented in the release firmware. So we had to find another way to gain access to these debug strings, and this is what I will talk about now. Um, so the problem here is, first, we need to know where we want to store this X, uh, these debug strings, and the, we, have, we don't have any x86 memory available at this time in the process. So we need to find another device or buffer where we can store it for later use. But the only device we didn't know about at this time was the, X, uh, the SPI flash. Luckily for us, writing to this SPI flash area from the PSP generated the necessary bus cycles on the SPI bus without altering the flash. Then we needed code execution on the PSP to inject our own SVC handler. And how we gained ex code execution, will, uh, Robert will talk about in the third part of this talk. But for now, we assume that we have code execution on the PSP already, can inject our own SVC6 handler, and then leave, uh, let it run. So the app will call SVC6. It will be forwarded onto the SPI bus, where we can collect it with our ex already existing setup. Use a tool to filter the debug strings from the rest of the uh, traffic on the SPI bus we don't want to have, uh, don't want to have in the uh, debug output, and then hopefully get a raw PSP log. And we had success with that. So what you see here is the initial boot up or the very first stage of the boot up stage. The uh, logs are me uh, several meg megabytes long, and we didn't have the chance to. Uh, go through all of them, so there's a lot of interesting stuff hiding there already. So, thank you. so the next step was to explore what is hidden inside the system management network. And we didn't want to always reflash the whole system all the time and write code for it, debug it, because it is error-prone and tedious. So we created our own setup where we could uh, dynamically use the x86 cores on the system to write and read from the system management network. For that, we replaced the SEV app with a stub, and the stub provides three uh, primitives. That we can read write a system management network address, we can execute an arbitrary syscall from the off-chip bootloader, and we can read write general PSP memory. And because the PSP is ex uh, exposed as a separate PCIe device to the x86, we used the existing Linux kernel driver and modified it to expose these requests to user land, where we created a user space library wrapper and some Python bindings. And with that, we were able to use a Python shell to dynamically read write registers, had a spurious reboot in between if you did the wrong thing, and but could start over very quickly. So what you see here in the code snippet is what we did to discover what these memory protection slots were about. You can see that we call an SV, uh, a syscall handler, that we write some system management network address, and so on. And we do it for all the different PSPs in the system. So the master PSP can also forward these requests to all of the other PSPs in the, in the whole system. Next thing, we wanted to also analyze the SEV app further and see what the or how the code is executed and how the data flows in this SV, uh, SEV app. But because we already had our PSP stub running there and couldn't share it uh, on the PSP, we had to find another method. And we created a PSP emulator for that. And using our libpsp proxy to forward requests onto the P uh, PSP. So the current state can run the SEV app up to a certain point. And um, we are still actively developing that. So that started a few weeks ago. And uh, that's, this, this will uh, uh, continue in the uh, evalu uh, development. So what it does is, what you see here is the AMD SEV tool to uh, manage the host and configure all the keys and, and certificates on, on the system. And we modified the Linux kernel driver to reroute these requests our, to our own PSP emulator running in user space, which is based on the Unicorn engine. Any hardware access, because we don't know much about the hardware yet, is forwarded to the real PSP. Results are collected. And when the SEV app finishes, it will return the result back to the AMD SEV tool. And with that, we are able to execute some of the requests the SEV app implements successfully so far. Yeah, what you see here is a small snippet from one of the traces. You can see a syscall being made. It's a CCP request. We don't know exactly how the uh, arguments are used by now. That's why there's a lot of unknown stuff. But this will aid us in development. And furthermore, in a, uh, addition to allowing it 
tracing code execution and observe the data flow. We later on may be able to provide functionality which is currently only available on the Epic server platform from AMD, like secure encrypted virtual machine. The problem here is we don't know yet if all the hardware is there which is supported and whether it's only a uh, firmware limitation by AMD. If you're interested, the code is here. On the repository, it will be made available in the next few days. We have a number of repositories available. You already saw PSP tool. We have some uh, repository where we collect uh, documentation about hardware interfaces, syscalls, and so on. We have um, our PSP emulator there, and also the PSP apps repository if you want to dive into writing your own apps for the PSP. And with that, I will hand over to Robert, who will talk about how we gain code execution on the PSP itself. Okay, so for everything that Alex talked about, we need code execution on the... Mike? Better? All right. So this part of owning the PSP is again split into two parts. Now, Christian already talked about the firmware and the SPI flash. So this is something we can control. Because we have physical access to the device, we can flash everything we want. So what can we do with that? So on the SPI flash, we have these directories, which have a header and entries. And an entry is actually compromised of an ID, an address, and the size. We've talked about files. So an entry could be a reference to a file. And we also talked about these secondary directories. So an entry could refer to another directory. Now, if you look at the files, you see that they have a signature usually. So we cannot manipulate those files directly. If we touch them, this will be noticed, and they won't be loaded, and the system will immediately reboot. Now, what we can manipulate is the directories themselves, because they are not protected at all. So specifically, what we can do is we can, for example, add additional entries. These entries might point to the same files. It doesn't matter. We can add entries. Uh, what we also can do is we can remove some of those entries. Or we can change entries. So um, for example, this reference to the secondary directory, this has a size parameter. Right? And this size refers to the size of that directory. And actually, what we can do is we can change that size. So we can make the directory appear to be smaller without removing any of those entries. Now, during boot, this PSP directory that Christian already talked about is uh, parsed. So this PSP directory contains, among other things, the reference to the AMD public key, which is used to authenticate all the applications which are loaded. Now, this directory also has a secondary directory. The content is not really relevant here. So the on-chip bootloader that executes first will set up this boot ROM service page that Alex talked about. And this boot ROM service page contains a copy of those directory entries, just for the first directory. And also, the on-chip bootloader will copy the AMD public key itself to the boot ROM service page. So it only copies the AMD public key if it's been verified before. OK, so now this boot ROM service page contains this AMD public key. And this public key in memory is from then on used to authenticate applications. So the off-chip bootloader, which executes later, will use that boot ROM service page and will extend it. Specifically, it will copy the entries of the secondary directory to that boot ROM service page. So I, I guess you can already see where this is going. Um, so what could possibly go wrong here? <laughs> well, we have space for 64 entries here. And if we write more entries to that page, we'll hit the AMD public key. So the off-chip bootloader should better check that we only copy at most 64 entries. There it is. There's a check. Let's say this is the function that appends entries. And it says, OK, if the number of entries exceeds 64, we return an error code and do not copy. Sounds good. Thing is, that number refers to the number of entries in the secondary directory. So this has a maximum size of 64. 
but there is already space there, uh, entries there on this bootroom service page. So actually what we enforce with this check is whatever we append can have at most 64 entries. And within that 64 entries, well, there's the AMD public key. Super convenient. So what we do now, we place our own public key inside the directory structures of the firmware file system. The off-chip bootloader copies the entries and copies the AMD public key. So what does it mean for us? Now, all this parsing happens before the first application is loaded. So that means we control the very first application and can replace the content. And from there on, we control the user land part of the secure processor. So now coming to the next part. So the natural next target is, of course, I mean, we have user land code execution. We want to have the rest, kernel mode. So how can we take over the kernel mode? Now, let's have a look at how this distinction between kernel and user mode happens. So if we look at the virtual memory layout, we'll see that there's a user mode part and a fixed split with the kernel mode where our off-chip bootloader resides. So our application, which we already control, can try to access that memory, of course, but that won't work, right? The MMU will prevent any access to privileged memory. Okay. So let's see how this works at runtime. So this uh, bootloader component, if we specify the privileged memory a little bit more, we have code and data there. And at runtime, another type of directory is parsed. And this is called the BIOS directory. I mean, it's a similar structure as the directory before. We have entries and the reference to a secondary directory. The entries here are, again, of no relevance. So during boot, the off-chip bootloader will copy those entries into its data section. Okay? So for the copy operation, we need some, some information. So let's say this is the copy operation. It kind of looks like memcopy. What we need is destination, where to copy. Uh, we need source. This is the secondary directory. This is the thing we want to copy, which is already under our control. So convenient. We control whatever, is, whatever data is copied. And we need the size value. So where do we get that size? Oh, yeah, this, this entry here has a size value. Super. It's ours also, right? We control the directory structures. We can manipulate the size. So to sum up, we have a copy operation into privileged memory with attacker-controlled data and attacker-controlled size. <laughs> this is a very old meme, and I think it's appropriate because this, this bug is so uh, easy to prevent, actually. But for us, it's good, because now we control everything in red here. Okay, So we control that, control that part. The thing is, as you can see, code is not part of what we control. So what might be here what is of interest for us to overwrite? Thing is, it's the page tables. <laughs> Right? The page tables are part of that data section within the privileged part of the virtual memory space. So again, what we do, we place our own page tables here. The data is copied and replaces the page tables in memory of the secure processor. So now if we look at that virtual memory overview again, well, our page tables will define the virtual memory a bit different. We make it everything user writable. So we control the application. Our application now can touch the privileged memory and just overwrite everything there if we want to. Right? For that, we need to have to re-implement everything, but we can patch now the secure operating system if you want. <laughs> so that means this parsing of the directory also happens before the first application. So we control the first application. That takes over the bootloader, if you want. And from there on, we have everything. Um, all those issues I presented were fixed, were even fixed before we discovered them. Right? So we might not be the first one that discovered them. There, if some of you remembered that there was some website called AMD Flaws, they did not present too many technical details. Maybe what they discovered was something I presented here. I don't know. Thing is, 
it does not really matter for us because the secure processor does not implement any rollback prevention. So we can always go back and refresh a vulnerable firmware and from that use whatever uh, code we want to place there. So what, what we did is we used all this on an Epic Naples-based server system. And you cannot just use that issue on every AMD system because the bootloader we are using was signed with a key specific for the Epic Naples CPU series. Uh, however, we believe, we have not tested it thoroughly yet, but we believe the same kind of issues exist in bootloaders which are signed with a Ryzen first generation uh, key. And for the rest, we don't know yet. So maybe for Threadripper or Epic Rome, there are similar issues. Maybe not. We don't know. So the question is, is this really a security issue? I mean, of course, it's a security issue, but for whom? So everything we did requires physical access to the device. So if it were my laptop, personally, I wouldn't be concerned too much. However, there are some things where this is a real issue. For example, if you rely on secure boot, because the secure processor is the first part that boots up, and if that is broken, everything later on is also broken. So uh, Christian already told you that AMD plans to use the secure processor trusted execution environment. If your application relies on that, you better not have any security issues in that secure processor. And for the last part, the secure encrypted virtualization technology from AMD is dependent on the integrity of the secure processor. If that is broken, this technology is also broken. So Christian and I published a paper of that, uh, about that. If you're interested, you can read it up. But for us here, this is actually more of an opportunity, right? Because we can gain more insight into this PSP. With code execution, we can do a lot of cool things with that. So it allows to do further research on other subsystems which are present in the AMD CPUs. For example, the PSP is responsible to load the SMU firmware. The PSP allows access to the SMM mode. So this is a ring minus two mode on the x86 CPUs. So higher privilege than your kernel. And there is proprietary code running in that mode. With the PSP, you have access to that code and could replace this, analyze it, whatever. And the PSP is responsible to kick off the x86 cores at all. So everything that comes later is, in theory now, under our control. Thank you. That's it. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Robert, Alexander, and Christian. That was fantastic. Um, wow. I have a lot of questions, I guess, in my head going on. But do we have any questions from the audience? And if you have any questions, we have microphones lined up here. A question is, just so that you know what we are talking about with questions, is a sentence with a question mark behind it and not your life story. Um, and I think I saw number one first. So let's start with number one. Hey, uh, is there a reason why the page table is located at the end of the data segment? I don't think so. I mean, just because <laughs> you have to place it somewhere. Should be in the. Why not in the beginning? Um, okay. I, don't, I don't know. No idea. Okay. That's what I meant with a lot of weird questions here. Um, from the signal angel, we had one question. Um, this question goes to the first lecturer. Uh, didn't you have access to an SPI flash emulator to attempt uh, time of use versus time of check attack? So um, uh, we had access to different tools, but the talk to attack that you mentioned was not even was not even necessary to to mount the attacks we we talked about. And actually, so far we don't see any um, possibility to mount a talk to attack. Okay. So I think I saw microphone five next up. Um, is there somebody in microphone? Yes. Oh. Um, yeah, so I was con wondering if you considered looking at the boot ROM for issues? Yes, of course. Um, the thing is, we cannot find its code in the memory anymore after we mounted our attacks. So I believe the 
boot ROM code is not there, which would make it more e uh, not there anymore, which would make it uh, much easier to analyze. Um, we tried simple things like increasing directory sizes, which are passed by the uh, boot ROM itself. We haven't found any suspicious thing there yet. Microphone two. Thanks for your research. Um, you have really nice. Uh, big power over the system right now. Do you have plans to make a PSP firmware which is minimal and uh, which makes your system work but without um, some strange untrusted code? Um, I wouldn't call it plans yet. <laughs> uh, of course, there are ideas to, to do that. The thing is, some of the functionality which is implemented from AMD is really required. So these this stages that Alex talked about, they configure your D or, and train your DRAM. So without those stages, you don't have access to memory. Your x86 cores wouldn't not work. And to re-implement that without having access to any manuals is uh, really, really hard work. So I'm not too confident that this will be possible in the near future. I just uh, refer to uh, Management Engine Cleaner. There is such a project which uh, makes your uh, management engine firmware slim. Uh, so the AMD firmware is already kind of slim. The only thing that is not strictly required on the systems we have been looking at would be the SEV firmware, which is loaded on request. And you can like, disable that by just flipping a bit inside uh, that file that would the system would still boot, but it, when it tries to initialize the SEV technology, it, the kernel would say, OK, this does not work. The system will still work after that. Thanks. And uh, last little question. Does PSP work with microcode somehow? Mm, we didn't find anything related to any microcode there so far. Thanks. So let's move on to microphone three. Uh, thank you uh, first for the great talk. Um, I have one question. Uh, do you have maybe found something evil or potentially evil in the code that it does? No. So far we didn't find anything which could be used as a, for an attack, for example. So what the PSP might be able to do is access uh, PCIe devices. Um, we found some code related to that, but we are, we, don't, we, are not, we are not sure yet whether it's actually used because also the PSP is executed or is existing on graphics cards made by AMD. So that might be also related to that. We couldn't find anything there yet, but so far the PSP looks rather clean compared to the internal management engine. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so we have a question from the internet. Is the AMD public key an RSA one only? 576 bits. It's an RSA key, yes, but it's uh, 2048 uh, bits for the first generation Epic CPUs, and I think uh, 4069 for later generations. Microphone two. Um, for me, it seems like preventing to flash old vulnerable firmware is really important for a scenario like secure encrypted virtualization. Can you comment on how difficult it is for AMD to add this rec retrospectively? OK. Um, so technically, rollback prevention is there for, I guess, mobile devices, for example. You have that. Uh, it should be possible. Uh, for adding this functionality afterwards, I don't think that's really possible, because the on-chip bootloader is the thing that loads the off-chip bootloader and verifies it. And that software component has to like, uh, stop loading if the firmware version does not match, for example. And you have to change that. And that functionality is not there. And you cannot update the on-chip boot ROM. So in that sense, I don't think that's, that's possible to change. And if you look at our paper, you will see that the firmware issues are kind of devastating for the SEV technology. Because there are some keys which are now accessible, which can be used for attacking SV protected guests. Thanks. Uh, microphone three, please. Um, one question. Did you analyze the uh, API to the x86 core? And did you find anything that could be exploited without 
flashing anything so that you could directly go from x86 to PSP exploitation? Um, yeah, we try to find the necessary code to interface with the x86. We think we found one uh, place where uh, the x86 cores are released after the PSP initialized the whole system, but obviously we can't do much with it except preventing the x86 to boot at all. And uh, otherwise, we couldn't find anything there yet. So we, we focused on, on a lot of uh, on, a, on a bit of other like the memory controller, and didn't have a deeper look at the, into the x86 interface. So what there is there is uh, the BIOS can interface with the PSP using uh, a special mailbox register which is mapped uh, um, in MMIO space in x86 for requests. So if it can, for example, the UEFI, when it boots, it will say to the PSP, hey, this is my uh, system management mode code region, please protect that for me, and it will execute this request. Um, but apart from that, we couldn't find anything so far. Thank you. So microphone four. Hi. Uh, so, is it correct that your work enables 100% open source firmware for uh, this uh, kind of processes? And if so, have you already contacted the core boot team to make that actually happen? Uh, so, in, well, 100% open source. Um, as for the PSP, there is this on chip boot ROM which we can't replace, right? So, this will be closed source. Then there is code of the off-chip bootloader until the first exploit, which runs, which is not open source. In theory, you could from now on take over the PSP, write your own code. But as I said before, you had have to re-implement re -implement a lot of functionality without having any documentation. Right? So technically, it's possible, I guess, to do something like that. Uh, practically, hmm, I'm not too sure. <laughs> So we're going to go to the internet for another question. Is it possible to block PSP from within Linux or BSD for the system's runtime by using certain boot flags? Sorry, to block what? <laughs> uh, to block the PSP from the uh, Linux or BSD. So what you can do is like uh, Robert mentioned already, you can flip the bit in the SPI flash and then the PSP once it uh, uh, initializes the whole system it, will, it won't run the SEV app, for example, because the signatures won't match anymore. And there is no other um, sort of interface where the PSP is actually triggered. We, uh, we couldn't find it so far. Microphone three. I think he was first. Oh, OK. All right, right. Microphone two, then. <laughs> Sorry. Um, did you try to enable any superpowers from PSP, like JTAG or? special tricks with voltage or something else? I mean, the first application that is loaded has some strings in it, like debug unlock. <laughs> Sounds interesting. But then again, um, JTAG, where would you access the JTAG of the PSP? You need to have some, some connection to the, the lines, right? Intel and supports USB debugging. Uh, yeah, I know, uh, with special devices, right? Uh, no, even via cable. OK. so. Anyhow, I have the suspicion that this debug unlock app is responsible to, to allow some debug mode, which then I assume with special hardware you can do have JTAG, but we have not touched it yet. Okay, thanks. Now, microphone three. So I'm as far from a liar as, uh, <laughs> lawyer as possible, uh, but could AMD in any way uh, file a cease and desist for anything you do? <laughs> Probably not, I guess, but just curious. Uh, I have no idea. <laughs> Thank you. And as I said before, we're not the ones that initially discovered, or probably not the ones that initially discovered these issues. And it's not really about these issues. I mean, for me personally, these issues are a nice way to get more insight into the PSP. And it's not about having the super newest security issue, whatever. So if AMD wants to file something, I guess they would have also filed other people that did similar research before. Maybe they did. I don't know. So we had uh, another question from the internet. How long did it take you to reverse engineer and develop all this stuff? Um, so. I think beginning of 2018, Christian was starting with uh, his master thesis. 
and we spend a lot of time on figuring out how this uh, firmware file system works and the boot process and writing this PSP trace and PSP tool to, to better understand the components of the firmware. And Alex joined in May, May, May ish this year. And well, we're still working on it, right? So the emulator, once we figured out a lot of information of the, about the PSP, I think the emulator was easy to, to develop. So in the sense that it didn't take too much time, but of course, there was a lot of work going into it before that. So I do not see, oh, yes, I do see another question from the internet. Let's yeah, go last question. All right. um, did you try to glitch the PSP by manipulating the voltage <laughs> of the SOC users? Why? I, mean, <laughs> yeah, I think our approach is easier. <laughs> but no, seriously, we, we did not try. So with that, I don't see any f uh, further questions. And I would like you to help me thank Robert, Alexander, and Christian for this fantastic talk.